Welcome back everybody. As you probably guessed from the video intro, this is the rifle that we are going over today from U.S. Arms Company. Now I'm sure many of you have probably never heard of U.S. Arms Company, as I had not either until they reached out for the review. And with this one, we went full send. So this is their uh, premium top of the line model. Um, they offer a variety of different tiers, if you will, of rifles, but this one's got all of it so all the different benefits and upgrades that you guys are about to see that they offer are in this rifle of course that makes it a little bit more expensive as well we'll get into all that later on in the review uh, but i suppose before we get up close and personal on it we'll check in with our advertiser and then see what kind of groups we can get with it and then get up close and personal and sort of walk through all those details before we continue on, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, and that is NAGR, the National Association for Gun Rights. Right now, they're giving away this very armored scout vehicle that I'm sitting in. Obviously, it's very cool. Obviously, they're out there uh, doing a good work every day to preserve our Second Amendment rights and get back the rights that we've lost over the years as well. Uh, if you want to sign up for the giveaway and support NAGR, there's a link down below in the video description. Again, thanks to them for sponsoring the video. Let's get on with it. Now we're going to see what kind of groups we can get out of this rifle in the gun right now. I have some Federal M193, nothing fancy. Uh, target is downrange at 100 yards. We have a primary arms Raptor 1 to 6 scope on there. So if anything, I'm going to blame lack of magnification if we don't get good groups. Um, and we have a few different groups. Obviously, this is not a match load, so we will see how it does. And then we have some other ammo that should shoot a little bit tighter but we shall see. Additionally, this is my first time using this Caldwell setup here. Uh, typically, you guys know I use the CTK Precision, but down here at the Southern Command, we don't have space for it. So a little bit more compact system. We'll see how it does. Well, not the tightest group from here, for sure. But again, that's just M193. Uh, up next, we have some Federal. This is a 55 grain trophy copper. So it's an all copper load. And we'll see how it likes this one. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Didn't like that magazine. I don't know why, but it is not like in this D&H magazine. All right, let me throw that here in the amend too and see what happens. All right, back on track. Group looked a little bit better. Up next, we have some Federal 69 grain Sierra Match King Boat Tail Hollow Point Gold Metal Match. So a little bit heavier. All right, the last load up is gonna be some 77 grainers, 223 from uh, the folks over at Gorilla Ammunition, once again with Sierra Match King bullets. So the heaviest to date, for sure. Interesting, that USGI mag locked in just fine. I don't know why I didn't like that DNH, but it did. Let's go check them out. You guys already saw the results, but we'll actually measure it out now. First up was that M193. I should also note that the gun was zeroed with 855. Just this range doesn't allow it for whatever reason. Um, so that's why we're a little bit off. I was basically holding lower left corner. Um, but anyway, with the M193, looks like center to center. We're a hair under two inches, so like, an inch and seven eighths center to center with that M193. Then we came down here with that Federal Copper stuff and it definitely tightened it up a little bit. Right there, we are at an inch and five eighths on that one. 
Then we were over here at the 69 grain, which is, again, for folks who are new here, you might not know, but folks who watch all the time, I've said that that's the most consistently accurate round across a variable, uh, varied rather, uh, barrels out there. And it showed itself to, to be the case again today. Uh, very, very accurate. And that group right there is five eighths of an inch. So uh, it is always a good shooter. And I should also note too, that when I zeroed this with eight by five, we were at about an inch and a half with that. This particular load right here, the last 77 grainer, we are at an inch and a quarter on that one. So uh, definitely an MOA rifle for sure. Again, this is just three or four rather random uh, selections that I just pulled out of my range bag. So if you actually work around and check different loads and see what it likes, um, you can definitely expect MOA or better results as we saw. We'll start out here at the end of the muzzle and work our way towards the back. So tip to butt for you Navy guys out there, you'll enjoy that. Um, we are gonna talk about the muzzle device at first. The one it comes with is a muzzle brake and it's the most effective muzzle brake I've ever used to date. I say that meaning it's not really a comp. So a lot of guns will have kind of hybrid comp and muzzle brake and they'll be over comp where it'll actually cause the muzzle to dip. Um, this one does not have anything like that. It just keeps it perfectly flat. The downside is it's an insanely loud. Just absolutely, it's the loudest muzzle device I've ever used to date. Um, so there's a trade-off for sure. But if you're somebody who wants to shoot three gun or a competition or whatever, and just keep your gun really flat and on target, it's one of the best I've ever used for that. That said, I'm not a huge fan of them. So we swapped it out here with our standard A2. And of course we were running the Gemtech can on there as well. Um, so it, they do offer it though with an A2 and it's actually quite a bit cheaper if you wanna go with that. They offer a number of different options that we'll I'm sure touch on throughout the video. Uh, the sights that it comes with, it comes with Magpul's Embus Pro sights, which are fantastic. All steel, uh, fold down nice and compact, nice and slim. And they're some of the more precise uh, backup iron sights out there on the market. So you do get them with the rifle from the factory, which I do like because a rifle should come with sights in my opinion. Um, but most do not offer that. Uh, continuing on down the barrel itself, it is 16 inch and uh, 556 chambering, of course. It has a nickel boron barrel extension. The barrel itself is cold hammer forged, mid-length, one and seven twist, MP, HP tested, and it does appear to have sort of a hybrid government profile. So like for example, uh, Criterion uses a barrel that's very similar to that, where it's thicker than your standard government would be in the rear, but it's not like H bar or anything like that, but still has a slight taper down to our 0 0.750 um, gas block on there, and then continues forward um, with the government profile. The gas block they use is a SLR titanium, of course, 0.75, just like the actual journal that we just discussed there, gas block. And when they actually installed it, they dimpled it and then set it with a set screw with a high temp thread locker. So exactly as I recommend here on the channel very often. So kudos to them. A lot of companies don't do that initially. You should also be able to say, or rather additionally, uh, there's a little bit of a gap there between the shoulder and where the gas block is, again, as it should be. Just one of those things that a lot of companies don't get right for whatever reason. Um, continuing on back here to our gas block, we have a nitrided gas, uh, excuse me, gas tube. We have a nitrided gas tube. Um, that's kind of a pro or con, I suppose, depending on how you look at it and your personal opinion. Uh, both work fine. The traditional non-melanated and the melanated will work fine. If you're going to run the gun in full auto, though, one thing to note is that if you have a melanated uh, gas tube, your barrel can fail before your gas tube will. And the inverse of that is not true if you have your standard gas tube, but I would imagine most guys are not running this on machine gun lowers. Getting into the handguard itself, you can see here, again, 16 inch barrel, it comes out right to 15 inches and it has that little bit of a slant on there to save you weight, but still give you an increased sight radius that you do get with the 15 inch rail. We have our M-Lock slots there at the three, six and nine o'clock positions. And then you can see we have a lot of weight removed in the in-between positions. Additionally, up here on top, the same thing. Obviously it's 1913 spec, but it's shallowed out or, or kind of hollowed out rather, and then scalloped out as well. So a lot of weight is removed there. So nice and lightweight there, dig that. Continuing on back, we have this reinforced um, quick detach sling swivel point. Now this of course is an aluminum rail. And uh, the reason it's reinforced is that aluminum, if you're shoving steel quick detach sling swivels in there all the time, eventually will wear. The reinforced version will take longer to wear, 
but eventually it still will wear. Just kind of know that going forward. But of course, having an m -lock rail allows you to put any kind of quick detach sling swivel points on there or non-quick detach for that matter as well that you choose to. Additionally, when we took this rifle apart to kind of get the barrel profile pictures that you just saw, um, the actual handguards nuts were thread locked on there. And you can see here by the actual uh, image that we're rolling in of our barrel nut, it does have an anti-walk feature with this steel insert inserted into the barrel nut. There's no way that thing can go forward without a something really, really bad happening, causing a lot of steel to fail. Highly unlikely. There's going to be one con in this review to this rifle, and you guys have already seen it during the accuracy portion, but that is going to be, there's a couple magazines that just will not lock in uh, with this lower correctly. Um, one of my Gen 3 uh, Magpul PMAGs, as well as that DNH one that you guys saw there, just won't go in there. It kind of is a byproduct of having a billet design. There's a lot of them out there like it that have similar issues, but just know that in terms of magazine compatibility, you might have one or two in your collection that aren't going to lock in there. Just, again, know that going forward. But with that, we do have a very enlarged, flared, uh, beveled magwell, which I do like, quick reloads. Additionally, uh, it's going to have a little bit more time on the milling machine, having these little lightning cuts done everywhere uh, throughout the lower receiver that give it that cool billet look that a lot of guys do like. You'll see here on this side, of course, the markings that we have. Um, again, more milling and those sorts of things. We have an enlarged trigger guard and it is enlarged and chonky, uh, very big. Uh, if you're shooting with gloved hands or something like that, you're gonna have no issues getting in there and manipulating that trigger. Um, and moving on here to our wedge lock system, I suppose we'll take it apart, really kind of get into that because as far as I know, it's the only system out there or the only company out there using it and it is kind of unique. As I'm sure most of you know, to take apart an AR-15, typically you just push these two pins out and it will come apart. Well, that's sort of true with this one, sort of not due to that wedge lock system. So they're super snug, as you would imagine. And of course we can get that front one somewhat loose there using something aluminum like our magazine base plate here. On this rear, there is no way that thing will not move until we release the tension from the wedge lock system when that is here. Now I should note that they make these with the ability to have it on either side of the rifle. So right now is how it was sent out to me, but I did swap it around and we'll tell you why here in just a second, but you have to push down and it's nice and stiff. There is a lot of tension on there for sure, which is good. Now at this point, we will be able to release our rear takedown pin because what that's doing is it's relieving the tension that it's putting on the lower receiver. You guys will see how here in just a second. Um, but at this point with it released and the tension off of it, it's very similar to any other AR-15 out there, but it's still nice and tight even without the system being engaged. So getting into that wedge lock system, what does it do? Well, number one, guys who like their uppers and lowers nice and snug, it does that for you. Additionally, as you use rifles, you get a few thousand rounds through them, the upper and lower fit may become a little bit sloppy. That rear screw right here is what allows it to be adjustable. So that way, even if you know it was tight before and it starts to get loose, you can still tighten it up uh, to match the wear on your receiver set. And you can see kind of there how it works being pushed up and locked into the tension here on our pins. And it doesn't seem like much because it's not. It's very fine-tuned, but it moves just a touch to snug everything up. And trust me, that rear pin is not coming out. Again, if you have it engaged, our trigger here that comes on this version of the rifle is the Elfman tactical drop-in trigger. It's adjustable, as you guys can see there, from two and three quarter pounds down to four pounds. Mine is set at four pounds. That's bad as like light as I like to get for a sort of combat style trigger. Um, but you guys can see here, there's literally just no take up at all. You just push that pressure on the trigger shoe and it is gonna release very crisp, very tactile, audible reset. It's definitely a nice trigger without question. The rifle does come with a H buffer installed. Additionally, we do have good staking there on the castle nut, something I definitely dig. We have our receiver extension, that's 7075 T6 aluminum, and we have our Magpul STR adjustable stock with the quick detach uh, point on there that you can move either side. And additionally, we do have the storage compartments on both sides of the STR stock. So if you want to put M&Ms or anything like that in there, you can do so. It is O-ring sealed. In all seriousness, you can put a couple CR123A batteries in there as well, which is a practical thing you might want to do on your rifle. And of course, we have this storage point as well as our traditional sling attachment point there on the toe. 
We pulled the guts out of the rifle to show you the charging handle and our bolt carrier group. We have, of course, an 8620 full auto profile, nickel boron finished uh, carrier here. And you can see we have good staking there on the gas key. One thing, I guess I will throw another con on there. It has YFS screws. I've literally never seen one fail. That said, it is not quote unquote mil spec in that regard. Uh, moving on to our bolt, it's 158 steel, it's MPHP tested, and it has the US Arms marking on there with 556. Additionally, on our extractor there, we have our O-ring and black insert, which I do like. You guys have seen we've had good extraction and good ejection throughout the video, whether suppressed or not, um, and that is due to that system there that you guys see. So good on them for that. Charging handle is going to be an ambidextrous affair with this Radian Raptor. Uh, very proven charging handle at this point. A lot of you out there probably already have them. Has a nice little gas busting ridge there, so when you're shooting it suppressed, you don't get a ton of gas in the face. But like I said, ambidextrous sticks out a little bit from the rifle, but not too much that it's going to get all hung up on your gear. It's a solid choice for sure. And moving on to our upper receiver, just like the lower, it is made out of billet 7075 T6 aluminum. And we do have our sort of enhanced shell deflector there. So if you guys are lefties out there, highly unlikely you're gonna be getting any brass to the face, but we have our unique cuts and milling done in there, which of course is one of the features that you get with billet. We have our Magpul Endless Pro rear sight on there. Again, we have our scope mounted up, so I can't flip it up and show you, but it is a fantastic sight. And we have a full review on the actual Magpul sights themselves. Uh, looking into the receiver, you'll see that nickel boron extension in there for good lubricity. And of course we have M4 feed ramps in there as well for feed. At this point in the video, you guys know all the details and specs, all those sorts of things that you need to know about the rifle. A couple things that we didn't cover so far that are obviously going to be important is reliability. So outside of the magazine issue that we already discussed, we had zero malfunctions of any kind, suppressed, unsuppressed, with you know, good ammo, bad ammo, whatever the case may be, match, non-match. The majority of what we put through it was M193, um, but we threw some steel case in there as well that you guys probably saw. And again, zero issues at all. Um, and that certainly is a good thing in terms of cost. Like I said, they offer a number of different series. They have the Pro and the Champion line. This is the Champion line. Like I said, their highest end rifle. And the way it's configured right now with the Cerakote finish that we have and with an A2 muzzle device on there, it's going to come in right around $2,300. So it's certainly not inexpensive. Um, again, with different feature sets and different you know upgrades removed uh, down on their low, low, lower level, they're going to be in the mid 1000s with that uh, for their offering. Of course, everything's made in America with billet receivers, yeah, add extra cost there. Uh, with our handguard, like I said, a lot of milling time went into that, so a little extra cost there. Um, but it shot pretty accurately, as you guys saw it should, with the setup that we have here, uh, provided that I do my job but it's expensive for sure and it definitely won't be for everybody but i know a lot of guys out there that have zero issues uh spending that type of money on there the thing i'd probably change if anything i'd add a forward assist because i like tapping it it makes me happy um, but a lot of guys don't like it as well so i get why they didn't put it on there to keep it a little bit lighter weight um, so with that i think that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions about the rifle, anything like that, you can always post them down below in the comment section. You can also post them over at my Facebook and other social media sites that you see here on your screen. Um, if you are subscribed to the channel, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, if you're not and you like this type of in-depth review, it's kind of the bread and butter of what we do here on the channel. Um, so hit that subscribe button if you've done that and you've hit the notification bell and you're still not seeing two to four videos a week here on the channel, uh, you can sign up for my email list that the website that you see here on your screen and that email goes out at most, at most, once a month. And it just has all the videos since my last email went out. So that way there's no social media giant censoring your eyes for my content with their algorithm. Um, and additionally, should this go on sale, any of the components, anything like that go on sale, um, we will put that in our daily deals email that as a suggests goes out every day and it has six or seven of the best deals that we find around the internet that particular day if it's in the email it's the cheapest that i know of anywhere on the internet that day um period it, otherwise it will not go in that email so saves you guys some time not looking around and also hopefully some money and uh with that we'll close the video thanks for watching i truly appreciate it and i look forward to seeing everybody in the next video